Welcome to Central Study Hour here at Sacramento Central's Seventh-day Adventist Church. Wherever you may be watching online or those who are here with us live in the audience, thank you for joining us. Our first song request this morning comes from Tony Vanterpool from Los Angeles, California. And he is sent in one of my favorite songs. The song is 440. How cheering is the Christian's hope? We'll sing verses 1 to 3. How cheering is the Christian's hope while toiling here below? It pours us up Let's Tony for sending that in. That it was a beautiful song. If you have a special song request and would like to share it with us, please visit our website at sacscentral.org. Take your your cursor and scroll down to the box that says uh, Sacramento Song Request. There you can send us your favorite hymn. Make sure you tell us your name, the title of the hymn, where you're from, and we'll be happy to sing it with you on an upcoming Sabbath. Our next song is hymn number 25, Praise the Lord, His Glory Show. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. Hallelujah. Praise him, praise him evermore. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are worthy of praise. You took upon yourself our guilt and our sin and died, stretched your arms out and died upon a cross, a cruel cross, to save each one of us. And I pray that you will help us to 
accept your grace and accept what you want to do in and for us. We ask that you'll send your Holy Spirit to be with us this morning. Help us to be attentive during Sabbath school. Help us to learn all we can and to share it with others. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Sabbath school lesson this morning will be presented by Pastor Mike Thompson, Associate Pastor here at Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's good to see you all. Uh, I hope you're blessed, and I'd like to welcome you all to um, Central Study Hour. Uh, We will have a free um, CD or a DVD of today's presentation. Uh, And if you'd like to have that, contact us and ask for CD number uh, C21919. C21919 and call us at 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at sexcentral.org. Family season. So we're on lesson, I think it's uh, number six. And it's the royal love song. So we're looking today in the song of Solomon. It's probably not read by a lot of people. They're not quite sometimes how to relate to it. Uh, But it's in the Bible. So uh, we're going to look at it some today. And there's a memory text from Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. And it goes as follows. Uh, Set me as a seal upon your heart as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement fire. Well, we'll come back a little later to uh, set me as a seal upon your heart. But let me begin by reading on Sabbath afternoon's page, the first paragraph by way of introduction. Among the seasons of life, one of the big ones is marriage. Again, not everyone marries, but for those who do, marriage brings, a special, brings special challenges and special blessings as well. Among those blessings is the wonderful gift of sexuality. What a powerful expression of love this gift in the right time and in the right place can be, and we stressed some of that last week. Contrary to popular opinion, the Bible is not against sex. It's against the misuse of this wonderful gift from the creator of human beings. Right at the bottom of Sabbath afternoon's page, it says, this week week we'll look at marriage as portrayed in this Old Testament book, Song of Solomon. But also as well, we'll we'll draw some analogies between uh, Jesus and his love, his passion that he has for his people, his church. But let's begin by going to uh, Sunday, Indivisible Life. And I'll read the question that it's posed there, that it poses, and it goes as follows. It says, based on the following passages, and I'm just going to quote one of the, one passage, so I'll rephrase that. Based on the following passage, how would you characterize the Bible's view of the human body? And I'm going to, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Right there at the beginning of the Bible, it speaks about how God created the first human being. And it says there in Genesis 2, 7, that God took the dust of the earth and he formed Adam out of that. The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Now, um, I will say I'm an old King Jameser. Um, but I'm not opposed to using any Bible, but I'm just an old King Jameser, and um, no apologies. We don't have Bible wars here, but why am I saying this? Because in the King James, I will admit, I've got to say this, that when it puts soul, it's not really the best interpretation into English of the, of the Hebrew word, which is nephesh. And in the New King James, in some of the more modern versions, they don't, they don't translate it soul, they, they translate it being. It says, so God took from Adam of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living being. And that's what he is. So there's two things that God took. It was the dust, the elements, that's what we come from. 
And he breathed into Adam the breath of life, that spark of life. We'll never understand it. It's uh, something you can't see, but suddenly this dust became a beautiful living being. Now, because of this idea, well, I'll read, I'll read a statement in a minute that deals with what I was just going to say there. But there's these two things, the dust and the breath of life. And through that, uh, we, have a, we have a living being here. But going back to ancient paganism, there's this idea that, um, that the dust and the breath are two separate things. You've got the body and you've got, you've got the soul. Actually, it's not like that at all. You don't have a soul, you are a soul. And every evangelist that stood up here has said that every time. <laughs> it's in the Amazing Facts lessons, and it's true. You don't have a soul, you are a soul. You are a full living being. Physiologically, biologically, anatomically. You have a body, physical body, you also have a physical brain, and it's that physical brain that manufactures these abstract things you can't see, such as emotions and love and those kinds of things. But you're all one entity. When you die, it all dies. But let me read this underneath. Kind of reiterate some of what I said. This is the first paragraph on Sunday's lesson. Some religions believe in dualism, body and the soul. They believe that they're separate. They believe in dualism, a philosophy that views the human body as a problem for the life of the spirit. If you don't get this, I'll explain it a little more in a moment. That is, the body is deemed bad. The Greeks were big into this kind of stuff. They, they thought that the flesh was bad. And this other aspect of dualism, the spirit inside, that was perfect, that was pure. So to them, to the ancient Greeks, when you died, your spirit, which is pure and perfect, was able to finally escape from this living uh, uh, prison of the human flesh. So to them, that was an escape. So they saw the flesh uh, as just evil. Does that make sense? Hope so. That is, the body was deemed bad while the spirit is deemed good. In Scripture, however, the human body, including its sexual characteristics, is integral to the whole being. You want to talk about sexual relationships, they're very much to do with the physical body, right? So if you get rid of the physical body because it's bad, then what do you do with sexual relationships? Well, there's no place for that. So we have to accept that God made the whole body with everything, with the emotions and the physical capacities and, and the desire and the capability to engage in, in intimate relationships. Uh, the psalmist in Psalm, I read Psalm 84, verse 2. It says here, the psalmist gives the whole of himself in worship to God. Psalm 84 and verse 2. Let me just read that quickly here. Psalm 84 and verse 2. We read this. My soul longeth for thee. Now that's from the Hebrew word nephesh, so we should really put life. We can put life there. My life, yea, even faints for the courts of the Lord, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. So he says, with all my life, the whole package, with all my heart, with all my body, I long for God. There's no dualism there, is there? It's the whole being, it's the whole living organism with the emotions and everything else. Okay, so it says the total person is to be sanctified and set apart for the holy purpose God intended, which means even sexual relationships. God ordained it, he created it, and it is a sanctified experience if engaged in within the parameters of marriage, a godly marriage. Going down uh, on Sunday's page near the last part of the last paragraph, it says the Bible's openness with sexuality calls its people to a greater level of comfort with this topic so that this vital aspect of life is treated with the respect and dignity due to so great a gift from the Creator. You know, sometimes you know, I don't want to talk about this kind of stuff. You know, it's kind of personal. Oh, God made us the way we are. And any, uh, I think, um, shyness or embarrassment, well, you know, we, you know how we are. But we need to come to the Word of God and realize He, he made us the way we are. Okay, I want to go down to this uh, question at the bottom, and it's a good one. 
How can we protect ourselves against cultural and moral forces that either make sexuality into nothing but degrading animal-like passion or turn it into something shameful that must never be talked about? How does the Bible show us that both extremes are wrong? Well, I've discussed the fact we should be able to talk openly and honestly about it. And we got to learn to do that with our children. And you know why, don't you? Because if you don't teach your children, who will? Somebody else will. Their friends at school, they learn it on the street. And uh, even at the best of times, you know, in, in my day, my mom told me about stuff. She says, there's some things your dad will tell you about when you're a little old. I didn't know what she meant, but I found out. But she told me a lot of things, told me where babies come from. And I sat there and I took it. I was about nine years of age. Um, but you must tell your children, because even in the arena of heterosexual relationships, they'll find out about that. But especially now in the culture in which we live, with other kinds of relationships, which are being pushed on little kids in schools, you need to be proactive as parents. You need to be right on the ball and get ahead of the curve, because if you don't, you're going to have to try and undo some of the damage that may be put into some of those innocent little brains. Anyway, you get the point, right? Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, let, let's move on to uh, let's move on to Monday. The loves of the love song. Um, there are many. Um, well, there are, let me put it this way: there, there are various acts, aspects of love that are presented in the song uh, of Solomon. And while we find pictured there the expressions of love, which are exclusive to the marriage relationship, we can nonetheless draw from this the more glorious picture of the love of God and Christ for his church. You know, a song of Solomon, it's this passion in there, and it's wholesome passion. But God has a passion as well for his people, for his children. And it's, it's a wholesome passion. It's a righteous, holy passion of love. There's a statement here. It's not in the lesson, but I uh, looked for it, and I found it in Five Testimonies, page 740. And you'll find it in several other places in the Spirit of Prophecy writings. But it's speaking of love here, how God's love compared with the best that we can even give to one another, to people who are madly in love, if you will, even the best that they can give, compared to God's love. Well, let me read it. It says, all the parental love, which has come down from generation to generation through the channel of human hearts, all the springs of tenderness between parents and children, and of course, a man and a woman, all the springs of tenderness that have opened in the souls of human beings are but a tiny rill, <laughs> just a tiny rill, a little trickle, compared to the boundless ocean, compared with the infinite, exhaustless love of God. Tongue cannot utter it, pen cannot portray it. You may meditate upon it every day of your life, you may search the scriptures diligently in order to understand it. You may summon every power and capability that God has given you in the endeavor to comprehend the love and compassion of the Heavenly Father. And yet there is an infinity beyond. Isn't that beautiful and isn't that amazing? Yeah, just, just amazing. And even when we get to heaven and uh, the scales come off and the shades come off and we see God, we can actually look in his face and we can look at Jesus and see the scars still that he bears. And after a gazillion years from the standpoint of heaven, we've understood more and more of his love. We will never exhaust that infinite ocean of his wondrous, mysterious, glorious, incredible compassion and affection and love that he has for us. We run out of adjectives, I know. Um, we serve a wonderful God, don't we? Amen. And the love that we see in human beings is just a reflection that comes from him. So with that in mind, this wonderful love of God, 
I want us to look at the Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 1, latter part of verse 1, and then verse 7. And we see this love, and we see here Christ speaking. We can, see, we can draw an analogy here of Jesus speaking to his church that he loves with such a, a, a wondrous passion. And it says this. This is Jesus speaking to his church. He says, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. You know what fair means? It means beautiful. You know, it's just, just oh, you're fair, like the sun, like the moon. Those kinds of things. Now, none of us would ever have any beauty. Well, you ladies might have some. Men, we just don't have a shred, so let's just accept that. Um, but it's true, none of us would have, ever have any beauty or desirability in God's eyes if it were not for the fact that Jesus makes us beautiful and desirable with the beauty of his own righteous character. Amen. Beautiful. And we can, by faith, receive this love gift from Jesus that does make us uh, beautiful in character. We can receive that even now from him as we receive him, as we become one with him spiritually in this mysterious relationship. Paul even called marriage a, a, a mystery of a man and a woman, they become one flesh. Do you really understand that? No, we don't really. And he says, I'm using this, I'm using my own words here, to try and explain to you this wonder of this mysterious union between Jesus and his church. Now, uh, Song of Solomon, chapter four, verse seven. There's a progression here. We see the same thing again with a little bit more uh, beside. Verse seven. Thou art all fair, my love. In the other one, it says, thou art fair, my love. Now it's thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. And I believe we can see pictured here the church, the kind of church that Jesus will eventually come to take back to heaven with him. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. That's the kind of church he's coming for. And his church will be so fair and beautiful because it will have perfectly reproduced, will reflect his beautiful, righteous character. Was it three weeks ago, four weeks ago? We had a symposium just here on this very thing. Page 69, um, Christ's Object Lessons. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. So his character will be perfectly reproduced in his faithful ones. And note again, thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. I'm going to have Jan read at this point. Um, and this ties in perfectly with what we're looking at. Well, Jan is going to read from Ephesians in a second. You can be turning there. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. Let's just take a moment to get there. Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 25 through 27. And here we see this relationship here between Christ and his church. And it is also used as an analogy to try and re uh, relate to that relationship between a husband and wife. Thank you very much, Jan, if you would read that. Husbands, love, you, love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with a washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Yeah, thank you very much, Jen. That's, that's a beautiful passage. So this picture of Christ's church, all fair and uh, beautiful, will be, will be realized very soon. That, that generation, I believe that generation is already on earth. Yeah, they just need to wake up. They're sleeping virgins right now. Um, we've been sleeping for far too long. But that will be realized uh, very soon. But again, only in those whose hearts have been given over to Jesus who reciprocate the best they can. Their love, they give it to him in this wonderful relationship. They, have, they love Jesus as no one else and there's nothing else. 
And so when that is so, he has our hearts. And when he has our hearts, then he himself will live there and complete his work of grace. A Song of Solomon 8, 6, set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death. When we let Jesus set his seal there upon our hearts, we permit him to write his name there. His seal is his name and it's his character. And as he writes his name there, he affirms ownership and he has a right to do that. He affirms his ownership and makes his claim upon our fullest affections, which are due him. Who else are they due to? Do we owe anything to the devil? Absolutely not. Do we owe our best affections to ourselves? Absolutely not. I know we do, but we shouldn't. And even to our spouse, as much as, may, as we may love our spouse, do we owe them our, our absolute fullest affections? Within the context of human love, absolutely. But there's a dimension above that, and that is the dimension of where we give our fullest and absolute affections to the one who made us and the one who died for us upon the cross as an expression of his love. So it's my prayer today that we will all permit him to set his seal of ownership upon our hearts and grant him his rightful claim to our fondest affections. And as it says in the Song of Solomon 8, 6, it says, for love is stronger than death. Christ's love for us is stronger than death. Husbands, love your wives. Christ also loved the church. And if you have a wife, and I hope you still love her, you should be willing to lay down your life for your wife. Um, but we know one thing for sure. Jesus certainly laid down his life for us, did he not? Uh, and this is most certainly, certainly true. He suffered the death, terrible death of, uh, of crucifixion. He did that because he couldn't bear the thought of abandoning us and leaving us to have to suffer what we rightfully deserved. But you see, when you love somebody, you, you, you'll, you'll take that cross in their place. And that's what he did for us. In... Uh, First John, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. What love? What manner of love? And in First John chapter 4, 9 and 10, it says this, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You know, such love as that kind of ties in with that statement I read from 5 Testimonies 740. It says, you may meditate upon it every day of your life. Uh, you may summon every power and capability that God has given you in the endeavor to comprehend the love and compassion of the heavenly father. And yet there is an infinity beyond. Um, but such love, when contemplated, and we should, we should do this every day. When we contemplate that love of God, because we see there demonstrated his love and affection for us, as we behold that, it begets affections and love within us that want to reciprocate. That is one of the mysteries of, uh, of God's love. It's not, and I've spoken about this before, and I, I make no, no excuses for using the same analogy. You look at love, it's kind of soft. You know, I mean, almost like if you can stroke it, it's very, very soft. It feels delicate and flimsy, if you will, if you could see it in your mind. And yet it is the most potent thing for smashing through the most What's the word I'm looking for? The most seemingly impregnable walls of resistance that are built up against it. It's potent. I'll use this analogy again. Some of you heard it, and I, but I'm going to use it. When, when you see tanks, military tanks that are in conflict, and they're firing rounds at one another, those rounds don't have explosive heads because the explosion would just hit the front of the tank 
do nothing to the tank. They want to get inside that machine. So they use solid, solid, solid heads. And in the A1 Abrahams, it's deleted uranium, I think. It's very heavy, solid stuff. And that thing comes out of that muzzle. I don't know what speed it is. But it goes downrange, and it can hit that armor plate and just, just go right through it. And because you have that mass and all that velocity, there's a whole bunch of energy there. When that, when that round goes through that armored plate and it goes inside, that energy has to go somewhere. So what to do? It all turns to heat. That thing just incinerates inside. The rounds go off, boom, that, that, that thing is gone. Well, God's love is like that. It's very soft and warm. But when you put yourself down, downrange from the cross and you contemplate that love, you'll start banging against that armor plate of a heart that may have been hard since the day you were born. A heart that is cruel and selfish and cold. A heart that may have hated God and cursed God and even kicked Christians in the face. But if you go there, that love, it will get through. And this is why you hear conversion stories of people who were just animals. They were monsters. They're in prison, some of them. But that's where God saved them. And that's where those hard hearts of some of those tough guys were penetrated by the love of God and just still as big and tough as ever, but they're gentle giants. That's what the love of Jesus does. And that's what he will do in our lives. If we will let that love in miraculously, we'll be changed. And we'll want to give that love back. And when we do that, we have passed from death to life. Gospel's a great thing, isn't it? It's not called the good news for nothing. Oh, okay, let's go to Tuesday. Tuesday, a loving knowledge. I'm going to read the last paragraph at the bottom of Tuesday's page. The Bible uses no... K-N-O-W, for the intimate union of husband and wife. In this loving knowledge, the most hidden, sorry, the most hidden inner depths of their beings are offered to the other. Not only two bodies, but also two hearts are joined in one flesh. This is this mystery here, wonderful mystery. No also describes the relationship between individuals and God. For the discerning Christian, the unique and tender knowledge of marriage, with its compassion, commitment, and unbounded delight, provides a, a profound insight into the most sublime and holy mystery ever, the union of Christ and his church. So with that definition of no in mind, uh, I want to read uh, the question that comes up here in, in the lesson. It says, um, with that in mind, let's ask the question that the lesson asks. How does the description of the marital union as knowing and rich, we've got some music this morning, a rich our understanding of our relationship with God? How does the description of the marital union as knowing enrich our understanding of our relationship with God. Well, we've got a couple of verses we can look at. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, and it says this. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. 4.25, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. There are some things that we can come to know and understand intellectually. But there are some things we can only come to know through experience. And there's no other way to do it. And it's this latter, knowing through experience, that the Bible is referring to when it speaks of e, Adam because he loved his wife. And that love progressed until he knew her in this intimate sense. Physical sense on one hand but the melding of their affections and their hearts. It was, a, it was a, a knowledge you could never get out of a textbook. And nothing's changed. <laughs> it's just the same today. So he got to know his wife in this respect. And within the confines of this knowing, this, this knowledge, 
it was in that context, in that arena that they procreated and they brought forth children. They brought forth fruits of their, of their love for one another. And that's why it was awfully painful that for Adam and Eve when the first little fruit that came forth, which was innocent, precious little boy turned up to be the first, turned out to be the first murderer. Imagine that. Uh, I'd like to dwell on it, but I can't. But Adam, he lived to regret that all his 930 years. But anyway, God is merciful nonetheless. He forgave him. But with this definition of knowing through experience, okay, I want to read from John 17, 3. And in John 17, Jesus is uh, he's praying to his father. This is not long before his crucifixion. It was the night in the upper room where he says this prayer for his disciples to his father. And this is what he says to his father in John 17, 3. Um, he says, and this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now the disciples had an intellectual knowledge of God, obviously. They had an intellectual knowledge of, of Jesus. And a little bit of the, the experience one with him. And God the Father, they had this knowledge, but they had no idea what it was to really know their heavenly Father in this wondrous, mysterious experience, which we call the new birth. And as we know, any genuine Christian knows, knowing God personally within that context is what really counts. Now, it's crucially important that we read the Bible. Read your Bible, pray every day. We need the Bible. Uh, in the Bible, we learn and understand the truth about God and Jesus. If it wasn't for the Bible, we wouldn't understand about sin and the devil. We wouldn't understand about salvation and, and how it works. But that in itself is not enough. We need to take what it speaks of when, when the Bible says, when God says, come and let us reason together, Isaiah 1.18 Come and let us reason together, saith the Lord. We need to do what the Bible says and go and have an introduction to God and come to know him on the, exper you could use the term experiential level. In other words, you have an experience with him. So it's just not good enough just to, have, to become a theoretical Christian. We must be Christians who are truly, truly converted and then we can enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, unless we have that relationship with him and the Father, unless a man is born again, will not enter the kingdom of God. So when we have this experience, we come to know God intimately on the closest intimate level. And we come to know him as our dearest friend. Now, what put you, I don't want you to put your hands up this morning, but ask yourself, do I know God as my most precious? Do I know Jesus as, as, as my most precious and dearest friend? You answer that. And if you don't, well, understand this. He wants to become yours and he's waiting for you to come so he can form that union with you. But if you can't answer that in the affirmative, take note. Take note of that, but go do something about it because he's waiting there with open arms to embrace you as his children. So we, we, we must go. Um, and when we know God as our dearest friend, sin then takes on a different thing. If we still stumble and fall, we don't see the fact I've sinned. Oh, I'm going to get into trouble now. I need to repent. Otherwise, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to lose out on heaven. We don't see it like that. Not that you can divorce that fully from your mind, but we see it more like, oh, I've hurt God. And your prayer is more like, dear Father, I'm sorry, you're my best friend. And I just let you down. I just failed you. I've caused you grief again. I made you weep. I am so very, very sorry. When you know him as you should, that's what true repentance will look like. Not that, oh, I did wrong. Better put things right before I get into trouble. No, it shouldn't be that way. So, anyway, 
When we know him like that, our lives are dramatically changed, dramatically changed, mysteriously. And as a man and wife become one, and they engage, of course, in physical intimacy, we don't do that with God, of course, but in its own right, it's just this close in intimacy. We become one in the spirit. It says actually in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. But again, to know God in such a way, we have to be willing to have no other gods before him. Does that make sense? See, just as a husband and wife cannot engage, cannot engage in a viable, fulfilling marriage relationship unless they forsake all other prospective uh, suitors or partners, they've got to forsake all those. And they, they give their love and affections only to one another. It's an exclusive relationship. Now, in this exclusive relationship that they have and we should have with God, it's often the case that between between God and me in this relationship, uh, I'll just tell you the truth, he by far is the most faithful one in this relationship. I let him down sometimes. He never lets me down. He's committed, but I let him down. And when I let him down, I feel bad. I feel bad about that. But again, I go to him and we can go to him and we say, well, I'm sorry, and he's right there. He says, it's all right. I'll never leave you. I'll never get rid of you. And what he does, he reaches out his arm to pick us up and embrace us. And he tells us in so many words as we hear him speak to our hearts in those quiet, intimate moments in our prayer closet. He says, come on, he says, let's build this relationship again. It's a wonderful God, right? <laughs> He's the most amazing being. Um, so we might be weak and we are weak but he delights to repair the relationship. And in this heart experience, because he is strong and he knows we're fallen beings, he gives us grace. He gives us grace and we learn to develop. He grows the character for us if we let him and allow him to do that. And from this wonderful relationship will come forth, there'll be offspring. We will bring out in our lives through this relationship with God, not little little nippers as we call them in England, little children, not that, but we'll have the fruits of the Spirit. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, the fruits of the Spirit. This is what will come forth. For, for every true relationship, there are fruits. If it's in, uh, anyway, let me just read it. And stop rambling on here. It says this, uh, Galatians chapter 5, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, you want more joy in your life? Then make sure your relation, your marriage relationship with God is as it should be. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. It doesn't mean the law is being abolished, but when you have those fruits in your life and your character and your relationship is one with God, the law is still there, but that law doesn't condemn you because your life is in harmony with it. So when it says there is no law, it means there's a law, but there's no law condemning you because you're one with Christ. And it says then, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections. There's no affection for any other thing in this world. They've crucified the affections and lusts. Oh, it's a wonderful thing. Anyway, let's, um, let's go on to uh, Wednesday. I have to move on here. Wednesday, love at the right time. Love at the right time. And I want to read the first paragraph. It's a little lengthy, but uh, bear with me. In the Song of Solomon, we find some of Scripture's most compelling evidence for God's plan that people remain sexually chaste until marriage. One of the most powerful is in reference to the Shulamite's childhood. This is the bride here, the prospective bride of, of Solomon. She was a Shulamite. Um, they came from the tribe of Issachar. One of the most powerful is in reference to the Shulamite's childhood when her brothers wondered whether she, she would be a wall or a door. And there's a reference there to Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 8 and 9, which would be a wall or a door. In other words, will she remain chaste until marriage? A wall 
or be promiscuous, a door. As an adult woman, she affirms that she maintained her chastity and comes pure to her husband. She says, I am a wall. In fact, she confirms that she is still a virgin up to their wedding night by saying that he is a garden, sorry, he says, yeah, in fact, he confirms that she is still a virgin up to her wedding night by saying that she is a garden enclosed, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. From her own experience, she can counsel her friends to take the steps of love and marriage very carefully. Three times in the Song of Solomon, the Shulamite addresses a group of women referred to as the daughters of Jerusalem to counsel them not to arouse the intense passion of love until the appropriate time. And you see the references there. That is, until they find themselves safely within the, within the intimate covenant of marriage, as is she. So there's a question here, bottom of the page. What good news is there for individuals who regret their own choices in the expression of their sexuality? In other words, they may have, um, before marriage, you know, sowed their wild oats, and certainly it's not uncommon, and um, feel that, you know, kind of feel guilty and unclean and those kinds of things that can weigh on the conscience and so on and so forth. Well, even though God invented the human body, he invented this wondrous thing of sexuality, and he intended that everything should be kept pure and chaste, and we don't always do that and we grieve him, yet he's still a merciful God. And uh, in John chapter 8, we, we see that. Uh, I want to turn to John 8 about the woman that was taken in adultery. And uh, I want to just read a few verses here. The whole thing starts on verse 3. And this poor woman, she was obviously a vulnerable woman. Her life wasn't pure, and so they were able to... Uh, you know, lead her into this trap, obviously, and then they sprung it on her and they found her in the act of adultery. And they, knew, they did this, the scribes and Pharisees, to try and entrap Jesus to see what he would do. It says in 8 verse 3, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. And what say you? They were trying to entrap him. Because if Jesus had said, no, she shouldn't be stoned, then they would have got him in trouble with the rest of the Jewish community because he was pushing aside the law of Moses. So they had him there if he said, it's all right. Or if he said, yeah, go ahead and stone her, they would have run to the Romans and said, you know this, this carpenter from Nazareth? He's saying that we should exercise the death sentence on this woman, but we understand, you know, or Caesar, that we're under your rule and we cannot impose the death sentence without your permission. They would have gone to Pilate. So here he is. And so he would, Jesus would have got in trouble with the Romans. So they thought, it's one of those gotcha moments, right? So they we've got him. So they continued this. But what did Jesus do? Verse 6, this they said, tempting him, that they might have an excuse. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And you know what he was writing on the ground, don't you? He's writing in the dust, the sins of these righteous hypocrites. He was writing them all there. And these men came and they started reading. And somehow, for some reason, their enthusiasm quickly began to wane. So they gather around and they see these things. Verse 9, And they which heard it, and read it, being convicted by their own conscience, they went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, 
So the first to leave were the dirty old men, and the last to leave were the dirty young men. And they were gone. And let me tell you, any young man looking in, don't scowl at dirty old men because dirty old men start life as dirty young men. And unless you have a heart change, you'll finish up a dirty old man just like the rest. So they were gone, off they went. Now this woman, we don't see it here, but in Desire of Ages, you should read it, she was cowering down. She was just trembling. She was waiting for the first stone to come flying at her. Verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself, he saw none but the woman. And he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And of course she looked up and they've all gone. <laughs> and she said, No man, Lord. And I just love this. And Jesus said unto her, The, the righteous creator of the universe, the one that made Adam, the one that made Eve, the one that created this mysterious, wondrous thing as sexuality. It grieves his heart when it's abused. It's this being, this mysterious, wondrous being. He looks at her and he says, woman, where are your accusers? And she says, no man, Lord. And he says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You know, that passage, I'm sure, has brought much joy and relief and healing to many fallen men and women for centuries and centuries. And there's somebody listening to this program today, and you may be down there in that pit. This is for you, if you want it. So God is indeed very merciful and forgiving. And there's some other verses in the passage. 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, cleanse us as well from all unrighteous. Isaiah 55, 7, it says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And then I just love Psalm 103. Let's turn there briefly. Psalm 103. And I want to read from verse 8 through to verse 14. It says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, Neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities, though we deserve it. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And I love this. Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. <laughs> okay, let's uh, go to Thursday and see if we can um, uh, complete this here. Thursday section is safeguarding the creator's gift. I want to read the first uh, paragraph. God has a special purpose in creating humankind as male and female. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. While each bears his image, the joining of gender opposites is the one flesh of marriage that reflects the unity within the Godhead in a special way. Yes, you can certainly uh, draw that illustration from that. The union of male and female also provides for procreation of new life an original human expression of the divine image. And then we ask the question here, what attitude does the scripture take towards sexual practices not in keeping with the creator's plan? Leviticus 27 through 21, 
You see, there's a, provides a listing of statutes that God gave to the children of Israel by which he, they could know beyond doubt what was inappropriate sexual behavior. And if you read that and you do it in your own time, it governed not only forbidden physical relationships between male and female, but it condemned also every form of same-sex relationship. But you'll find some people who we might call present-day sexual revolutionaries. They might try and argue and say that such uh, prohibitions, they're all outdated. That, that's the Old Testament. We live in the 21st century now. We're in California, Pastor Mike. Well, that doesn't go anywhere with me because as I read the Bible, the same righteous God we have in the Old Testament is the same righteous God we have in the New Testament. The same yesterday, today, and forever. So we cannot say that this is just old stuff. It was done away with at the cross. It most certainly wasn't. Men are still men. Women are still women. And there's that intimate relationship that God himself wants to be pure. So we need to preserve that. So I want to thank you for looking in today at Central Study Hour. Let me tell you again, you can have a free CD or a DVD presentation of today's uh, lesson if you contact us at Sacramento Central Church. You can ask for offer number C21919, C21919. Call us at 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at saccentral.org. G. So thank you for watching us. God bless. And uh, we'll see you next week at the same time, God willing.